We turn now to a story of promises made but not kept and work done but not paid for. At the centre of it, a retail chain called Nosh and well over 100 staff still owed hundreds of thousands of dollars in unpaid wages. For those of you who don't know Nosh, it was an upmarket grocery store based in the Upper North Island. The company owned six of them and there were completely independent franchise operations, two of which survive. In July, the company went into receivership and the Auckland stores all closed. By that stage, staff and suppliers were all already owed significant sums of money. But staff spoken to by Checkpoint say they were personally reassured they would be paid and some kept working, even helping to pack the stores up. Sharon was head of HR and payroll. She worked in admin at NOSH for five years and is owed $14,000 unpaid salary, money she earned and money she needs. But she said there were many staff worse off than her, including couples who both worked at NOSH and lost their entire household income. I know we've had one couple that family in Australia had to help them out, you know, to pay their rent. There was Matakana, the girl that her mother and herself were, like, you know, being evicted from their home. They couldn't pay their rent. They had no food. And this is just, you know, one or two stories that I can tell you, but I can say, well, myself as well. You know, we were all, like, really... A, 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 we, I left there in June, and I never got paid um, my two weeks that I worked for. These others, they never got paid for two months. They never got paid, and they were just promised, oh, don't worry, money's coming in, money, money's coming in. But the money never, ever came in. Sharon, so, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Who made those promises? That was John Denise and Andrew Phillips. Jonathan Denise and Andrew Phillips. Did you That's ever right. hear either of them make those promises? Oh, yes, in meetings. They used to have me... Look, they took the business over in February. When they did that, they, um, you know, called us in support office and um, they came up there and then they said, oh, don't worry, you guys don't need to worry. All your jobs are safe. Nobody's going to, you know, be dismissed or anything. Well, that... Um, wasn't true because they got rid of some people. Then in the meetings, you know, like as time went on, they never paid the suppliers. And, um, you know, the suppliers started coming to the stores, taking their stock off the shelves and that. And then um, they promised us in the meeting, oh, don't worry, you know, money's coming in. You know, we, we, we've we um, applied by such and such a, a bank or such and such a place. Money's definitely coming in. John Denise, in one meeting, that we were all sitting in with him, the support office staff, he said, he, in his own words, was, even if I have to sell my house, I will do that to save the company. Did you hear him say that? Oh, yes. I can actually tell you all the people that was in that meeting. So you heard him house. say that you heard him say that he would sell his own home yes. to, to pay the bills and to pay the staff? Yep. Yep, that's it. And um, Andrew Phillips was then. Andrew Phillips still patted him on the back, you know, and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, you'll do that. <clears throat> so at that stage, we were still quite confident that, <clears throat> you know, excuse me, that we will still get paid. So but that's why... Forget Now, I, I need you to tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth and you need to, to correct me if I'm wrong in any way, but is that yep. why people stayed on even after the shops were closed, even after there was no revenue, nothing coming into the tills because they had been made promises by the bosses. Yep, they were promising all the time. All the time they were promising money is coming in, money is coming in. They've got the, the, um, these people, or they applied by this bank, or, oh, money is coming in. But the money just never came in. So that, that's basically it, John. Like, you know, I'm, I, I just feel so sorry for those poor people out there because we had uh, the majority is young, you know, like young people, couples, and, and uh, um, the generation was mostly youngsters as well. The support office was more um, like older people and that. But I just felt so sorry for the store staff, like really. Why are you speaking up? Because I just feel that it's not fair what they can do. Because John Denise has been declared bankrupt 
twice before and how can he come and just do this and make promises to people and he doesn't do this. It's not just for myself, it's for the others as well. That's Sharon, a former NOSH worker, owed $14,000. Now, Damien Grant is the receiver. He listened to Sharon speaking to us. And we asked Damien about this Jonathan Denise man, the man Sharon said had staked his house on the fact that staff would be paid. It's unclear exactly what his role in the business was. So him coming in there, he is potentially putting himself in the position of a director. He may well have opened himself up to some liability there that's um that's really i'm the receiver there's a there's a liquidator in charge of this company chap by the name of uh, digby noise so that's more of an issue legally for him than for me absolutely but, and i i absolutely understand the receiver's role and i also yeah. understand that you come in after the fact so you weren't involved in any of this stuff but no. if john denise told a meeting of people that he would stake his house on financially supporting them. Is that something that the receiver and or the liquidator can consider moving on? Is there a kind of verbal contract there or is it not that simple? He doesn't own a house. So he doesn't, he doesn't own a that. house. There is a property that it's held in trust. That, that, that is an issue that we have looked at, but John Denise does not own a house. So there is no, he was, offering a guarantee, but there was nothing behind that guarantee. So roughly 100 staff are owed wages. How many? Do you know the exact number? Um, I would have that information, but not to hand. But um, I think it's slightly more than 100. A lot of the staff, though, were... I think there was about 80 full-time staff and about another 20 to 30 part-time staff. And it's, it was quite a lot of money that was... Uh, outstanding as well. Several hundred thousand dollars of, of holiday pay, unpaid wages, uh, accumulated leave, that sort of stuff. So it's, it was it was pretty big dollar values. And how much of that on a, you know, cents per dollar basis are they going to get? Nothing. Nothing at there's all? No, there's, there's no recovery. When we were appointed, uh, we were appointed by Andrew Phillips, who was the director who had advanced uh, $800,000 into the business. He will lose almost all of that himself. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I should caveat that uh, Andrew Phillips is my client, so um, I'm not a liquidator. I'm not, I'm not necessarily an objective uh, ob observer here. But uh, he came in on good faith. Um, he, put, he put in about $800,000 of his own money, uh, and he was given several undertakings, undertakings um, from you know the gentleman that you, you called previous caller was discussing. Jonathan Denise. Uh, so Jonathan, so the same sort of uh, big talking that was persuading the staff to stay on and work even when there was no revenue coming in any longer. That Andrew Phillips was also receiving similar kind of assurances from Jonathan Denise, was he? Yes. Yes, he was. And that was why... So, uh, Phillips is a established, uh, competent business guy in Australia, um, saw an opportunity, um, was given some assurances. Uh, I mean, and his, his money went... A fair chunk of his money actually went to paying staff prior to uh, receivership, um, and as well as to um, help pay for the acquisition of the, of the business uh, from Veritas. Uh, and... So he's, of all of the people who've lost money here, he he has lost by far the most. What what's Jonathan Denise's track? Jonathan Denise's track record. What are his other businesses? What how have they gone? Um, well, I'm not an expert in uh, Jonathan Denise, um, although I've had a number of dealings with him. Um, he's certainly uh, an interesting uh, individual. I mean, he's he's been in the hands of the official assignee twice before. Sorry to, to interrupt there, but the shorthand for that is that he's been bankrupted twice before, right? Yes, yes, that's correct. And and look, that's that's a matter of public record. And so most of the other people, so we're talking about Veritas and Phillips. I mean, this this is information that they would have have access to or the ability to gain access to. It's a bit difficult for the staff, of course, because they 
they probably would not necessarily have known that or, or, or necessarily had the ability no, no, to... No, that's right. No, no, that's that. right. I mean, you're earning, you know, you're earning 16 or 70 bucks an hour working on the floor and you're not going to do due diligence on Jonathan Denise, no. are you? No, you're not, no. That's Damien Grant, the receiver. So promises were made, guarantees given, and the man Sharon and other staff members named was Jonathan Denise. What does he say to the staff who believed him, who are still unpaid for their work and, in at least one case, lost their home? We called him. Jonathan, it's John Campbell from Radio New Zealand. How are you going? Good. Good, good. Look, I'm just phoning you about the position of the staff at NOSH, over a hundred of whom... That was our attempt to get hold of Jonathan Denise. We tried again calling from the same number immediately, and this time no one answered.